Hi, my name is Ethan High. Welcome to Play With Your Music. In this video, we're going to be talking about DIY home recording, recording in less than optimal environments. Uh, while you might have the opportunity to record in a professional studio, most of the time you're going to be in a place like an apartment, a garage, a basement. Um, and what we're going to be talking about in this video is how to minimize the downsides of such an environment and how to take advantage of some unsuspected upsides. So I'm talking to you in a music classroom in the NYU Steinhardt building and this is a classic less than optimal recording environment. Uh, to my right we've got a really noisy air conditioning unit. Um, to my left we've got some windows facing out onto the New York City streets. So we're going to be talking about what you could do to uh, eliminate those kinds of noise. Um, the walls in here are mostly plaster, the floor is carpet, uh, the ceiling is acoustic tile which is probably pretty similar to what you might have in your apartment. Um, so we're going to be talking about the sonic qualities of all those materials and uh, we'll do a little microphone technique as well. So here we go. So one of the properties you want to think about in your space is the natural reverb. And the natural reverb might be a good thing or a bad thing. And in this room, it's a bad thing. Most of these, uh, two of the walls, this one behind me and this one over here, are plaster. The one over there is just bare cement blocks. Over here, it's these velvet curtains, which are nice, but that's still highly reflective surfaces on three sides. Uh, I don't know if the camera mic is picking this up, but... This room has a really ugly kind of slapback echo to it as the sound you know, goes off my hands against the wall and back to me. And it's got a little bit of a high-pitched metallic component. So if I was going to record an album in here, I would want to really minimize the reverb. Uh, we'll talk about how to do that in a second. Um, fortunately, there is carpet on the floor and acoustic tile on the ceiling. Uh, if there was, you know, a wood floor or a concrete floor, you know, and something else reflective on the ceiling, the echo in here would be much, much worse. Uh, now, natural reverb is not always a bad thing. Uh, sometimes people will choose specific spaces to record in exactly because of their natural reverb. Uh, for many years in New York City, there used to be a recording studio on 30th Street called The Church because it was in a church. It's where they recorded Miles Davis' Kind of Blue and many, many other albums that you probably have. And churches are great, right? They have that humongous, beautiful, natural reverb. Um, you might get a similar kind of effect from really any large building made out of a material like stone or concrete. Uh, wood gives a really nice reverb. If you're in a room that's all, you know, hardwood floors, wood walls, wood ceiling, you might get a really nice reverb. The reverb you get off concrete and plaster is usually pretty bad, but you know, who knows? Just try walking around the space. <coughs> Clapping your hands like this is called an impulse. Uh, you can also pop balloons, which is much more effective because it's a heck of a lot louder. Um, some people fire starters pistols. I don't recommend that because you can get in trouble. Uh, balloons should work fine. Uh, and just experiment, you know, see what kind of reverb you get. See if you like how it sounds. If you like how it sounds, natural room reverb is often a lot better than what you could do with a plugin. It's just more organic. It's going to be more unique than that same reverb plugin that everyone else uses. Uh, so the best thing to do is just trust your ears. All right, so let's talk about the issue of noise. Uh, if you're in a home environment or really any non-studio environment, there's probably going to be some environmental noise. The bad news is, once you've recorded it, there's no getting rid of it. You might be able to mitigate it a little bit with plugins, but really, once it's in there, it's in there. Uh, you might consider doing like a professional soundproofing job on your space, but that is going to be a lot of money and a big construction project. Uh, for most of us, that is not an option. Uh, you might be tempted to just staple some of that egg crate foam up on the walls that you see. I wouldn't bother, it doesn't do anything. Um, what does work really well, surprisingly well, are just regular old curtains. So behind me there's a window uh, facing out onto the roof of an adjoining building with a gigantic air conditioner on it. That's the noise that you're hearing. And I'm just going to draw this curtain. Alright, so the noise is still there, but it's way quieter, right? 
And you don't have to totally eliminate noise from your recordings. Uh, as long as it's, you know, subdued, that's usually good enough. Um, if you don't have heavy velvet drapes in your house, you can also use moving blankets, uh, which actually they use in professional studios all the time. Mattresses work incredibly well. Bookcases are, work unbelievably well. Really anything that's soft, that has an uneven surface to it, and that is separated from the, uh, from the wall or the window is going to work. Um, you've also got people walking in on you, opening the door, which is actually kind of okay. Um, for the purposes of this video because, um, yeah, this gets into, you know, the joyful logistics of DIY home recording. So part of the joy of DIY home recording is turning the liabilities of your space into assets, finding the things that are sonically unique about it and using them for uh, new sounds that nobody else is able to do. So I'm standing here in front of a bare cinder block wall with a metal cabinet next to it. If there's anything that sounds worse than the reflections off cinder blocks, it's the reflections off metal. And normally this would be a terrible place to record, but it's so reflective in this corner that it actually is kind of a cool effect. Um, and I might consider if I wanted like a spacey, otherworldly sound, I might consider just putting my mic right in that corner and in fact facing it toward the corner and not towards me so it got more of the reflections off these surfaces and less of the direct sound of my voice. So I could go, wise men say. Might not sound that dramatic on the camera mic, but in my ears, right in that corner, it's actually really cool. So something worth experimenting with. Windows are gonna be problematic. First of all, glass is a very reflective material, uh, about as reflective as concrete or metal. Also, windows tend to face out onto the street. And uh, we're actually filming this during one of the rare occasions when they're not jackhammering on that street outside, but most of the time they are. Um, curtains, heavy fabric curtains, are kind of the best solution for dealing with windows. Even these, uh, these blinds, um, they don't have terrific acoustic properties, but definitely better than nothing. At least they'll deaden some of the reflections off the glass. They won't do much for the sound outside, but if you're really concerned about that, you can always prop a mattress up against the window or hang a moving blanket. Anything you could do, again, to put some soft material with air behind it in between you and the source of noise is really going to help a lot. So now we're in the hallway, and as you can hear, the sound is quite different. Uh, this hallway is a long rectangle, and the walls are plaster, ceiling is plaster, the floor is linoleum tile, there are also a bunch of metal filing cabinets against the wall, and uh, glass display cases. Um, this is really uh, a bad recording environment, bad, but for special effects purposes it might be great. The reverb in here is really unique. All of these parallel surfaces uh, set up what are called standing waves. So any sound that I make is going to bounce back and forth, back and forth, up and down, the long way, and persist for a really long time. So if I was going to do a vocal, uh, it might actually sound really great in here. Worth a try. Another good place to look for interesting natural reverb is institutional staircases. Uh, as you can hear, the reverb is even bigger in here than in the hallway. Here, check this out. I mean, that hangs for like 10 seconds. That's really terrific. And if you want to maximize it, what you do is you put your sound source at the top of the stairs and your mic at the bottom of the stairs. If you know the uh, Led Zeppelin song, When the Levee Breaks, that drum sound that they got, the way they did that is they put John Bonham at the bottom of a stone staircase in an old Victorian loony bin and put the mics three flights up at the top of the stairs. He played as loud as possible, they got that humongous reverb, and then they actually slowed the tape down a little bit just to make it deeper and sludgier. Uh, yeah, staircases are different. Uh, we are now in the men's room of the 7th floor of the NYU Steinhardt building, um, and light staircases, bathrooms, especially institutional ones, tend to have fantastic reverb. I mean, here you got the linoleum floor, you got tiles on the wall, you got a mirror, you got bare cement up on the ceiling, on the tops of the walls. Uh, 
if I wanted a dry sound, I would obviously not do it in here, but if I wanted like a 50s rockabilly kind of reverb, I would definitely do it in here. Now, these kinds of, you know, really extreme reverb sounds might be a little over the top, but what you might do is uh, do a blend of wet dry. So you might record your vocal somewhere more normal, somewhere a little bit more dead, and then what you can do is just take a speaker and a microphone, play back your vocal in a room like this, uh, into the microphone and record it before artificial reverb and digital plugins. That is, in fact, how they did reverb. They would have a speaker at one end of a room like this and a mic at the other, and they would just record it. And then you can mix, you know, whatever amount of the reverb sound you want uh, to your own taste. So we're back in the music classroom, but instead of hearing me on the camera mic, you're now hearing me on this mic. And for the rest of this video, we're gonna be talking a little bit about microphone technique. So the mic that I'm using is called a Shure SM58. And I, you've probably seen one before. If you've ever gone out to hear live music, this is probably the mic that they used. Um, take a look. So the reason that you see these everywhere, uh, there are three reasons. One, it's cheap, costs about $100. Two, it's super durable. Uh, this one, you can tell, is all beat to hell and it still works fine. And three, it sounds pretty good. It doesn't sound amazing, but for 100 bucks, it sounds pretty darn good. Uh, so if you're gonna be doing DIY vocal recording, you definitely want one of these mics. You might want a nicer mic as well. For example, a large diaphragm condenser. Those are those like old timey mics. Uh, elastic suspension cages and that are much bigger and have these big mesh cages around them. Uh, what I found recording in my apartment is my large diaphragm condenser uh, didn't get results that were as good as my cheapo SM58 because my large diaphragm condenser was too good. It was too sensitive. It was picking up my refrigerator, the bus going by on the street, the clock ticking on the wall. No joke, it got every undesired noise. Whereas the SM58, because its frequency response is a little bit limited, it tends to not even pick all that stuff up. The other thing that's good about the SM58 is that it's a very directional mic. And what that means is that uh, the pickup, the amount of sound that the mic is going to detect is very dependent on what direction it's facing. So check out what happens if I just move the mic away, even a little bit, even one foot away, really changes the volume level of my voice. Same thing is true if I angle it, if I angle it up towards the ceiling, you lost like three quarters of the volume right there. Um, if you're, by the way, trying to record with one of these mics and you're getting bad results, make sure it's horizontal and like practically touching your mouth. If it's like this, it's not going to work. That's a different kind of mic. So because the SM58 is so directional and because its pickup falls off so rapidly with distance, uh, you can do a lot with it to ameliorate a not ideal recording environment. If there's a source of noise like this giant air conditioning unit that's on the other side of that wall, just face away from it. Right? If there's street noise coming in from the window, just face away from it. Anything that's coming this direction, the mic is either not going to pick up at all or will barely pick up. Um, so if you, as I mentioned earlier, if you prefer to sing without headphones on, you just want to have speakers, just make sure the mic is pointed directly away from the speakers and it will pick up very, very little of the speaker sound, even if they're really loud. It's a pretty beautiful thing. Um, in addition to the SM58, uh, there is its cousin, the SM57, which is good for instruments. It looks a lot like the 58, except its head is flat instead of round. Uh, people do sing into it, but it's really more intended for things like guitar, drums. It works great on guitar amps. You can use it on piano. You can use it on pretty much anything. And like this mic, it costs about 100 bucks. Um, so... While the correct technique for this mic is to use it like I'm using it, up close and angled directly at your mouth, it's worth experimenting with bad mic technique. It's worth experimenting with the sound of it all the way back here. It might have to turn it up a little bit, might have to sing a little louder, um, but it's also worth experimenting with the off-axis sound. Again, maybe it sounds terrible, but maybe it sounds really cool. Uh, you just have to experiment and use your ears. So. Uh, we've got a ton more resources about microphones and microphone technique. Check the links at the bottom of the video. Thanks for watching.